sing number 336 is it for me we'll sing the first second and fourth verses is it for me dear savior thy glory and thy rest for me so we can sin shall i be so blessed oh savior my redeemer what can i but adore and magnify and praise thee and love thee evermore is it for me thy welcome thy gracious center For me so full of sin, O Savior, my Redeemer, what can I but adore and magnify and praise Thee and love Thee evermore? I'll be with Thee forever and never grieve Thee. Savior, I must praise thee and love thee evermore. O oh, Savior, my Redeemer, what can I but adore and magnify and praise thee and love thee evermore? Invitation song is not on our books. It's one of those uh, old songs that may be new, uh, but it's called The Blood That Stained the Old Rugged Cross. Good evening. Have you ever experienced a change in plans on a trip? It could be a business trip, a vacation, or even a mission trip. Um, I know that those who went to Uganda are back safely and we're th very thankful for that, but I'm also sure you guys have experienced this yourselves. Um, and just last week we heard uh, Jordan's change of plans that turned him into a detective in LA. Um, Kristen and I ourselves, we always joke about the fact that whenever we take trips, there's always a day where the travel just isn't as we planned. Um, some instances of this are uh, the passport name not matching the ticket, which they will not let you on the plane. Um, a canceled flight. Uh, this led to us flying to a different city. Uh, when we got to that city, we were shocked to realize that the taxi drivers were on strike and barricading the airport. Um, so there were a lot of uh, smug French taxi drivers that day. Um, and then also a glitch that prevented our return flight uh, from getting home. Uh, thankfully, before it took off, they discovered it, and so we just had to wait an extra day. Uh, but all these experiences, they weren't things that we were expecting, but there were things that happened, and we adapted, and we continued on. There's a story, um, or there's, there's a person named uh, Nicholas Winton. Um, he's a British um, stockbroker. He was a British stockbroker. Uh, did very well, uh, lived a pretty good life, extravagant life in some ways, and he was planning a trip to go to Switzerland uh, to go skiing for vacation. But he received a phone call that changed his plans. Um, instead of going to Switzerland, he went to Czesko Czechoslovakia, which is a really hard country to pronounce, so do not do this during a Devo. Um, but he decided to go there. And the reason why was because he received a phone call uh, from some people asking for assistance to help with removing uh, Jewish children from the country before the Germans came in. And so he changed his plans, he flew out there, and so by day he was a stockbroker, um, but by night he was a politician, he was working with a lot of diplomats, talking to people. Um, even when the government was slow on getting passports, he even forged them. Um, but. By the time that the Germans shut down his operation, he and his team had gotten over 600 children out of the country. I think most of us here tonight, we know that the world that we live in, um, this world is not our home. 
Um, we all have plans. We all have things that we do to fill our time, and those aren't necessarily bad. Um, but sometimes maybe we should be more like Sir Winston and have a change of plans. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. It can be important, I think, for us to sometimes just take a step back from our plans and to look at them and to see if they're in line with storing up treasures in heaven. Um, going back to the story of, of Nicholas Winton, um, or Sir Nicholas Winton, one of, the, one of the another amazing aspects of that story was no one knew about it for 50 years. It wasn't because he was trying to hide it. He just, it was something that he did and something that he just moved on from. Um, but it wasn't until 50 years later that it was discovered and the BBC uh, did a special on it and they had invited him into the, um, into the audience. And so at the end of the program, they went up to, to the audience and they asked the audience, if, if you were affected by his decision 50 years ago to save children, would you please stand? Everyone rose. Um, everyone in, in that place, were, was one, they were the children that he had saved. Would it not be awesome to be able to see those around us in heaven whom we helped sow the seeds and whom we encouraged to follow Jesus? If you haven't been baptized tonight, I would highly encourage you to take that step tonight. If you're going through some struggles or some difficulties, um, we love you, we're here for you, and we would love nothing more than to pray for you. Um, but whatever your need may be, please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Blessed Savior died, gave his life to save the world from wolves. In his pain and agony, for every sin to hide, shed the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Was his blood, his precious blood, that stained the old rugged cross? Was his love that paid the awful cost? Oh, so, so far astray, come and plunge today in the blood. That stained the old rugged cross. To the cross, a rugged cross, they nailed his precious hands, and in death he fully paid the cost. There is pardon in his love for. Stands for the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Twas his blood, his precious blood, that stained the old rugged cross. Twas his love that paid the awful cost. So, so far astray, come and plunge today in the blood that stained the old rugged cross. What an awful death he died to pardon you and me. Can now be holy free by 
the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Does his blood, his precious blood, that stained the old rugged cross. Twas his love that paid the old for cause. Oh, so, so far astray, come and plunge today in the blood that stained the Before we go to prayer, uh, just want to announce that Barbara Money had eye surgery. I want to let everybody know. Uh, if you would, please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity midweek that we have to come and to pause our midweek activities and to, to gather and study another portion of your word. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our teachers and the lessons that they've prepared. We ask that you would be with them and help them to present it in a way where we'll be able to to take the things that they have and to grow closer to you and apply them to our everyday lives. Dear Heavenly Father, there are those that have had surgery. Uh, we want to ask that you be with them and uh, if you would restore them to a reasonable portion of their health, it would be your will. There are also those that have lost loved ones. We ask that you would uh, comfort them as only you can. Dear Heavenly Father, as your children, there's times we say and do things that we shouldn't. We ask that you give us the uh, strength to overcome these things and forgive us of those shortcomings. We ask this prayer in your son's name. Amen.
Well, welcome to our class this night. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 9. And if you don't have a lesson sheet for lesson 9, raise your hand. There's, there's two pages. There's the first page. <laughs> Second page, yeah. Yeah, just hold your hand up. They'll get to you. We're not going to be there long. Uh, but I'll wait to hand out the second the lesson sheet for chapter 10. Uh, let's see. Get, get up here to where I want. There we go. So let's just catch up very quickly. Uh, this chapter is where um, thank you. Where the Donkeys have been left, uh, lost, and uh, uh, Saul's father, Kish, has sent him to find the donkeys along with the servant. Uh, they can't find the donkeys, and then the, Saul wants to come back home, and the servant says, hey, you know, there's a guy over here that can tell us where those donkeys are. And uh, Saul says, well, I don't have anything to give him. We ate all the bread. It's all gone. And the servant said, I've got a tenth of an ounce of silver. And so they went to see Samuel. They find Samuel. Samuel already knows he's, they're coming because the Lord told him. And uh, they're having a, a big meal up on the high place, the, um, the Bama. And so... Um, Samuel invites them to dinner and uh, so they go up there and as we remember uh, Saul gets the the big piece of meat uh, for, for the feast and um, he is the guest of honor he sits at the head table so now we, we get to the end of that when they had come down from the high place the Bama into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house, um, on the roof. Now, you wouldn't come to my house and get up on the roof. Uh, we wouldn't do that, but there they had a flat roof. And uh, so they went up there. We don't know what they, we don't know what they talked about. There, there's no indication. They said they uh, spoke on the top of the house. And then early the next morning. So now we know that Saul, uh, Saul spends the night there at this house. We don't know if it's Samuel's house um, in Rama or if it's a place, another town, and it's a house that's made available to him. He is priest. He is the prophet. And so he would have certain, and the judge, he would probably have certain facilities made available to him. So wherever it is, it's basically Samuel's house. And so uh, Saul spends the night on the roof. We assume that that's where the servant stayed also. And so early the next morning, they get up. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe they're already up or maybe Samuel called up there and woke them up. Uh, but he tells them to get up, uh, that he's going to send them on their way. And so it doesn't tell us about the servant, but it, we know the servant gets up because he's going to go with them in a minute. But uh, Saul arose, and both of them went outside, he and Samuel. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to go on ahead of us, and he went on. Now, we're at the edge of the city, the three of them are walking along, and Samuel tells Saul to have the servant go on, and here's what he says, but you stand here a while 
that I may announce, and that's kind of an interesting word if you, if you recognize the word is the word for here, or, and so it says that I may make you hear. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, so, the, the way the Hebrew is, it's an imperfect tense, and it can either be something that's in the past but not completed, or it can be something in the future. Well, here we know it's, he's talking about, this is something I'm going to make you do. I'm going to make you hear the Word of God. So, Saul, it's not me talking to you, it's the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but when the Lord starts speaking, we better start listening, hadn't we? And so, again, there's all these conversations, and yet we don't know what's said. All we know is... Samuel stops Saul and says, I've got a message from the Lord from you. And so stand right here while we do this. And now that brings us to chapter 10. And guys, I need these handed out if you don't mind. Uh, oh, y'all really volunteers. Good. I'll just remind you, if you miss any of these sheets, go on our website uh, under resources, and all these lesson sheets are available to you uh, in case you miss one. Chapter 10 gets, uh, I think, gets more excited. Things, things start picking up. All right, thank you. Chapter 10. So we have Saul and Samuel standing on the outskirts of what we think is probably Ramah, uh, Samuel's hometown, uh, because he's sending Saul and his servant on, so it makes sense that he's staying back in his hometown. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? He just ate at the head table. And now he's having oil poured on his head. Um, he's got the word of the Lord, but that's going to come a little bit later. And it's almost as if in the midst of Samuel pouring oil on his head, he said, wait a second, what's going on? And Samuel says, uh, it's because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? I don't know. Um, but, but again, I want us to notice, it's not because the Lord has anointed you, and uh, again, that word for anoint is the word from which we get Messiah. Uh, in, in this, this uh, sense, it's a verb, mashach. You commander, and, and the word used is not king, he made him a nagid. Now, I, I don't know that that means a whole lot, except he doesn't use the word king. He used the word for a prince or a commander or someone who is subordinate to the Lord. That's the main, that's the main message we should get out of that. But I just want you to remember that word nagid, because we're going to see a verb in a little bit that's used over and over and over again that's related to that word. Now, here's the, here's the message. When you have departed from me today, you will find two men 
Well, what he's going to do, he's going to give Saul three signs. Three signs that are going to happen to him that day. Three events that, that Samuel is predicting. The Lord has told Samuel, Samuel's telling Saul. Three events that are going to happen. And because of those three events, you can know, you can know with certainty that the Lord is making you king over Israel. You will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza. And I'll tell you in advance, we don't know where Rachel's tomb is. We don't know where Zelza is. But now I can tell you, if you go to the Holy Land and you ride a bus from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, you come to a T in the road and you turn left and over on the right there's a big sign pointing to Rachel's tomb. And most people don't believe that's where it is. Uh, but I, I just tell you that, I always want to stop there. I mean, it says Rachel's tomb. I was like, when I was a little boy, we'd go to places and it said George Washington slept here. Do any of y'all remember those places? No? Am I the only old? Yeah, some of them do. Uh, I, I remember this restaurant we went to down on the coast of uh, North Carolina. And there was a big old, old tree. It's probably from the Revolutionary War days. And there was a big marker out there that said, George Washington slept here. And I, it's always fascinated me. How do they know that, you know? But anyway, um, they, again, I'm just telling you, if you're looking at the bus between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, you'll see a sign to Rachel's tomb, and it's probably not anywhere close to that. But anyway, so, so we don't know where it is, but they, it's going to be beside Rachel's tomb. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. Now, didn't Samuel already tell Saul, your donkeys have been found? These two men are going to confirm it. Uh, they're off in nowhere. There's no communication. They're not cell phone texting. Those two men don't know anything about Samuel but they're going to tell Saul that the donkeys have been found. And now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and worrying about you saying, what shall I do about my son? Isn't that what Saul earlier said to his servant? We need to go back home because I know my daddy's worried about me. He's going to stop worrying about his donkeys. And he's going to be worrying about me. These men are going to say, your donkeys have been found. Samuel's already told you that. Saul's going to hear these men say, your daddy's started worrying about you. That's going to be kind of interesting to hear. I put this up. This guy who drew this map said, okay, um, they started off in Gibeah to find the donkeys, and they went up here and they made this big circle and they came back down here to Rama, went to the high place for the feast. They're going to have them go over here to Gibeah, the hill of God. Now your text says it mentions the hill of God or at least it does in the New King James Version. I'm not sure what the ESV says. But do you see some similarity between Gibeah and Gibeah? I mean, they're almost the same word. Uh, now, let me show you this map. Now, this, I use this map because it tells you where some of these places are. Here's Jerusalem, and you go north of Jerusalem, and there's Bethel. And that's going to be mentioned in a minute, but, but it's between here. Here's Gibeah. Here's Gibeon. Here's Geba, and then in a minute we're going to see Geba. If, if you hear all those G's and B's and ah sounds, when you see these words in Hebrew, 
you can see why they get confused and they really don't know what the, where these places are uh, because the names are so close. So when they do translations, it, it gets very confusing. Then you shall go on forward from there. So the first sign, here's the first sign, was the two men telling you the donkeys are found. Here's the second sign. You'll go on from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. Well, nobody knows where that is. And there three men are going up to God at Bethel. We just saw it at the northernmost point on that last map. One carrying three goats. I would like to see that. I would like to see this man carrying three goats. I think that would be an interesting scene. Um, I hope they were really young. Uh, three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you. I will come back to greet you in a minute. They will greet you and give you two loaves of bread. Remember, they, they're out of bread. They, they ran out of bread. So they would probably like a snack on the way home. So they're going to get two loaves of bread uh, from their hands. Okay, that's the second sign. You're going to meet these guys, uh, one with the three goats, one with the three loaves of bread and one with the skin of wine. Now here's what, this word, well, then, there we go, greet. They will greet you. Anybody have something else there in the text besides they will greet you? I'm sorry. Oh, salute. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I didn't see that one. What's another one? S salute. That's interesting. Um, it's literally asking for peace. And they will ask peace for you. Um, we do something similar, or at least I do. God bless. May God bless you. Well, here they're saying, I ask peace for you. That's a nice way of greeting someone. Because when you say peace in Hebrew, shalom, it's not just may there be an absence of war. It's more like, may all of God's blessings fall on you. I mean, it's, it's a very uh, whew, bountiful wish uh, for the person. So when you ask peace for someone, ask shalom for someone, you're asking for God's richest blessings to follow you all the days of your life. So uh, that's better than saluting or welcome or greeting, I think. That's a... a pretty significant. So that's the second sign. After that, you will come to the hill of God, Giba. Anybody have something different there? Elohim. Elohim. Is that Gibeath or just Gibeah? Which one? Okay, Gibeah, Elohim, the hill of God. Remember, I showed you on that map that one over on the bottom left was Gibeah, Elohim. Just to the west of Gibeah, the, the home of Saul. Where do you think they went? Well, as we read the text, it makes sense they went to Gibeah because people are going to know who Saul is in Gibeah. Yes. Yeah. Why does it say? Because doesn't Elohim mean sort of little G God? Yahweh is big G God? In a sense, 
Okay, okay. Let, let me, let me, I know people can't hear you up there, so let me, let me go with uh, uh, Philip's question. Um, Elohim, well, first of all, whether it means big G or little g is by context. In the beginning, God is Elohim, created the heavens and earth. That's the big G. So it can, context determines if it's big G or little g. So here we know that they're referring to the big G. Why did they not use Yahweh? It's a good question. Um, I, I'm 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 gonna shoot from the hip on uh, the use of Yahweh, the divine name which they won't even pronounce. Uh, even today, the Jews will not pronounce Yod Hey Vav Hey, the Tetragrammaton. I would say that if you said the hill of Yahweh in this context you would be dragging Yahweh down. Because you're talking about something material. Now, God created them. And to us, Yahweh, God are the same. But uh, to the Jewish people, and especially the historian writing this, would be a big difference. So... But a good question, and it's one to think about, one to think about. But, but again, our, the point is, this phrase, hill of God, you can have Gibeath, Gibeah, Gibah, and Geba. And I guess you can throw in Gibeon in there too. I mean, look at your choices, and we don't know where, where any of them are except probably Gibeah. That's the closest we can come. And uh, we're going to see in a minute where it makes sense that really talking about Gibeah. Uh, did they make some mistakes in the copying? I don't know. Again, when they write these words, it's not with all those vowels in it. It's just three consonants. And all of them have those three consonants, uh, all of those words. So uh, that may be a little confusing, more Hebrew than you want to know. But uh, what, I, what I wanted you to see was we don't know where any of these places are. And if your translation has something a little bit different, like the ESV did with Gibeah Elohim, it's because translators are looking at these Letters and they're saying, we believe it's this. And the other translators are saying, we believe it's this. And who's right? Okay? But we'll come back to that again in a minute. Where the Philistine garrison is, that's kind of important. Now, the, remember, the, the Philistines aren't troubling um, Israel as long as Samuel is judge. And he's been judge about 40 years. And, but they do have a garrison there, which means they have encroached into Israelite territory very deeply. And it will happen when you've come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets. Uh, the word for prophet is Navi. Uh, Nabi or Navi, you'll hear it pronounced both ways. Um, coming down from the high place. So they've been up at the Bama. <laughs> Don't make a big deal of trying to figure out something with the stringed instruments and the different instruments. I don't think it really plays a role in, it was just something they did. They were all playing kazoos when they came down from the, I don't know. Uh, one of them playing a gazoo, one a harmonica. But it has nothing to do with uh, what actually happens and takes place. 
I've read I don't know how many commentaries trying to make a big deal out of that and none of them made any sense. So you can take my word for it or you can go waste your time and, and read a bunch of silly stuff. Uh, with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. And the word for prophesying, the verb is naba. So prophet is nabi, and to prophesy is naba. Then the spirit. Um, I, I'll mention this word, the spirit, because. Um, it, it, it occurs a lot in the Old Testament. Uh, like spirit in the New Testament, pneuma in Greek uh, can have several meanings. The, the Hebrew word ruach has a lot of meaning. Uh, it can mean spirit. Uh, it can mean wind. Uh, it can mean several things, but here... We know, and the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Well, uh, that's quite a sign that, that the Spirit of the Lord is going to come on Saul. He's going to prophesy, and he is going to be turned into another man. Um, if we fast forward, one day the Spirit of the Lord is going to leave Saul. He's going to be a different man again. When you and I become Christians, we become another man or another woman, don't we? A new man, different person altogether. And, and, and I think if we understand that concept, we can understand about Saul being turned into a different man um, and, and let it be when these signs come to you, these three signs, that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. Saul, you're going to be the next king of Israel. That's a scary job, but we wanted you to know that when these three signs occur today, they're going to happen that day, you can know God is with you. You do what you think is best then, but know that God is with you. And then here is the puzzle. He's, he's told Saul about these three signs, and then he says, You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you or make you know. That's another one of those things. Make you know, show you what you should do. I think this isn't going to happen until chapter 13. I think. When Saul gets worried that Samuel doesn't show up when he's supposed to, Saul takes it upon himself to offer sacrifices. Ooh, and then the Lord decides to take the kingdom away from him. But nothing else fits into that of going down to Gilgal or anything else except that story in chapter 13. Why is it here? I can't tell you. Uh, that's one of those secret things belonging to God. I, uh, nobody can tell you the answer to that one, but that makes the most sense. Uh, there's no traveling down to Gilgal yet anytime in this. It just won't fit in. It, it's got to be Samuel telling saw something else that's going to happen in the future and Saul is going to remember but too late. So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart and all those signs came to pass that day. Saul, you're going to be a 
a different man. Yeah, he is because God gave him another heart. All those signs came to pass that day. In, in English, if you turn your back on someone, sounds negative, doesn't it? Yeah, have you ever corrected a child and they turned their back and you said, wait, well, get back here, boy. Uh, that's just... Has that ever happened to any of y'all? Raising children? Oh, thank you. Sometimes I think I'm on a different planet, so I just want to <laughs> find reality. <laughs> uh, but here it doesn't. It just means he, he turned to go away. It, it's nothing negative uh, in that text. I've been talking a lot. Any comments, questions? Chapter 11. Maybe I'm calling the wrong chapter. Hold on. Well, let me look. I may have just said the wrong chapter. <laughs> Well, uh, renewing the kingdom there, but but the problem is, let's go back. Seven days you shall wait. I think that's the the key that sends it into because that's where he violates. That's where he violates. And as Dr. Cloud would say, yeah, there's one other person that believed that, but they're in a nursing home now. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Patrick. <laughs> that's what, when somebody would come up with a, a proposal, that's what he would say. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> There's that hill again. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets. So now we're, 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 we've had the signs predicted. Uh, we've been told that it all happened that day. But now he's going to tell us the third sign, how it comes to pass. When they came there to the hill... There was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God, just as foretold, Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And we don't know what all that means. Uh, a lot of commentators say they, uh, they uttered ecstatic speech. Well, I don't know that. Uh, they don't know that. All we know is they prophesied. Uh, prophesied in the Old Testament is usually a message from God. So we don't know what was said, but we do know that whatever was happening, Saul was prophesying with the other prophets. Now notice what happened. And it happened, there's my phrase, Vayahi, when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied. If all the people who knew him formerly, where would he have been? Logically, he's back in his hometown of Gibeah. That's why I, why I made the point of looking at all of those words that sound like hill and Gibeah and Gibeoth and Gibeon and Gibeah. It makes sense they're talking about Gibeah because people knew Saul. They formally saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets. So they saw little Saul grow up into a young man, and now he's with these prophets. <clears throat> and prophets evidently were, I don't know, quite a sight to behold. Uh, it was a new thing, uh, fairly new. And uh, so a, a band of prophets come and uh, playing their musical instruments, and there's Saul in the middle of them prophesying, and they say, what happened to Saul? 
I'm sure people see me and say, what happened to him? He preached? I know some couldn't believe that. Uh, uh, well, I won't tell all those stories. Philip, you have stories? I got stories, but we won't share mine tonight. But I can just tell you there were some people who would be shocked that I preached. Um, oh, why don't we run out of time? Um, so they said, what has happened to the son of Kish? I mean, they know Saul. It's got to be they're back in Gibeah. They know he is the son of Kish. Is Saul also among the prophets? Wow. I mean, they are wondering what has happened to Saul. Is he among the prophets? I don't know if we've got time to do this. Maybe. Then a man from there answered and said, But who is their father? Now, he's asking, who is the father of the prophets? They know Saul's father. It's Kish. So he's asking, who is the father of the prophets? Well, who would be the father of the prophets? I think they have heard that Saul had dinner with Samuel. Now, I don't know why Saul didn't know who Samuel was. But I think the people of Gibeah knew Saul was the prophet. I mean, they had been listening to the words of God from him for 40 years. He was the judge. He made the circuit. He was the prophet. And he was the priest. All three of those things. I think they knew that Saul had been in the presence of Samuel. So when this man asked this rhetorical question, he's kind of rebuking these people who said, is Saul among the prophets? I think he's saying, look, who's the father of prophets? But well, Samuel, he's, he's the leader of the prophets. If Samuel is prophesying with the prophets that came from Samuel, don't be questioning what Saul's doing. It's legitimate. And so I, I think he's kind of chastising them. And therefore, it became a proverb. The proverb is, is Saul also among the prophets? And what does it mean? If there's a big change in someone and it's unrecognizable, you use this proverb to, dis to display it. If somebody had come up to me this afternoon and said, uh, won't you join me up at McDonald's for some ice cream? Beautiful day, wasn't it? Hot, sunshiny. And I said, let me have a rain check. It ain't raining out there. What does rain check mean? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now, does that start to make sense that that's what the prophet, proverb means? I mean, this is, this is an unrecognizable action on the part of Saul, someone they've watched grow up. And when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. So he's through prophesying. Now he goes to the high place, the Bama. I think that's where we want to end. Any last comments? Questions? Is that where you're going to seven days? No. no. Gilgal is where it's to wait seven days. That's why I think it, it'll make more sense when we get to chapter 13. That seven days, and you wait for me. It'll make sense then. But why it's put there, nobody can explain. Because uh, everybody I read just so we don't know why. Have a good rest of the week. See you Sunday.